Do you feel like you don't speak enough English? That you need to know more words? Then stick around. With these lessons, you'll pick up some of the most common words in just a few minutes. Now, this video is a small portion of our learning program. To get the full lessons, translations, and fluency fast study tools, click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome back to Top Words. Today we're gonna talk about 10 ways to stop translating in your head. Let's get started. Identify objects around you in English. The first way to stop translating in your head is to identify the objects around you in your target language. So if you're studying English, that means you look at the objects around the room, look at the things in your life, don't think of them in your native language first. Think of them in your target language first. So if I look around the room, I see a computer, I shouldn't think my native language word, I should think my target language word. So start with the items and the situations in your everyday life. If I say computer in English, maybe I should say computer in Japanese. I should say not, I don't know, water in English. I should say omizu in Japanese. So start associating the words in your target language with your everyday life now. So if you're studying English, that means start getting familiar with the things in your everyday life in English. Repeat phrases you hear native speakers use. Tip number two is to repeat the phrases that you hear native speakers use. So if you're watching this channel, for example, or you're watching a TV show or a movie, uh, listen for the way that native speakers make those phrases. If you hear a phrase you have never heard before, or you hear an interesting combination of words, try to repeat them yourself. Don't just listen. Try to say them yourself. If you're in a public space and it's difficult for you to do that, fine. Practice in a place where you feel more comfortable. Maybe if you have some private space to practice. Just repeat them. Get your mouth used to saying the words the way that the speakers, uh, the native speakers do. So if you never actually say words, if you're only taking in, if you're only listening and you're not actually producing the language, it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, to practice and to, um, to really hone your pronunciation, to improve your pronunciation. So when you listen to native speakers, try to repeat after them. So for example, if you're studying English, you can try to repeat after this video. You can repeat after the things I'm saying because maybe I'm using an expression or I'm using a certain uh, series of vocabulary words together the way a native speaker would. And it's a, maybe a good idea to try to practice the ways that native speakers put their words together. So try to repeat after native speakers, especially when you're looking at media. Uh, and you can do this when you're reading books too. You can try to read out, um, read out loud interesting lines of books that you find or something that maybe is difficult for you. Very nice practice tip. Make a situation where you can't escape into your native language. Make a situation where you can't escape into your native language essentially means immerse yourself. Of course, going to that country or going to a place uh, where you can speak only that language is very difficult for some of you. Totally understand. But if in your life you can create a situation in your library, in your room, in your house, somewhere, for just an hour or, I don't know, maybe a day, I don't know what your schedule is like, but if you can create a situation or create an environment where you have no choice but to use that language and you cannot escape, meaning you cannot uh, go back to using your native language as a crutch, you can't use the native language at all, it forces you to use the language that you're studying. So of course, if you are lucky enough to live in the country or to live in a place where people speak the language you're studying, great, but you have to go out and interact with people. You have to put yourself in a place where you have no choice but to speak. It's very hard and it's very scary and it's very embarrassing at first, but if you take time to find places and to make environments that are comfortable for you, where you feel comfortable making mistakes and asking questions, it's very valuable for your learning process. This is actually something that I did, totally. I totally did this. My Japanese wasn't very good for, 
a long time. But then I started making friends who could not speak English.、Uh, actually, I just did this through finding hobbies. There was a hobby that I had. I joined a group. I joined actually a school to where I could learn how to do that hobby, and everything was taught only in Japanese. And the people in my class only spoke Japanese mostly. And then maybe we would go out for drinks and food、uh, late at night or on the weekends, and everybody spoke only Japanese. And if I couldn't communicate even simply in Japanese, I had no hope of keeping that friendship together. So it forced me to study. It forced me to think about the words they were using. Uh, and to try to learn those words, those patterns, as well as how to produce them naturally myself. So I was learning the vocabulary words the people around me were using, and learning how to apply them on my own. That was only possible because I had no escape <laughs> in those situations. So try to do that,、uh, even if you can do it yourself in your house. It's super helpful, I think. Watch TV and movies in your target language without subtitles. Tip number four is to watch TV and movies in your target language without subtitles. Without subtitles, so I think that watching、uh, with subtitles can be very beneficial.、Um, so if I'm watching something, or if you want to watch something with subtitles on, great. But I sometimes find that、uh, I can, in my case, I I think too much about reading the subtitles and I forget to listen. So maybe if you've seen a movie in your target language a few times、um, with the subtitles on, try turning the subtitles off and think about the like characters' body language, the words they're using.、Um, you can always look that up later. Look up the you know the words you don't know in a dictionary, but try to do it、um, where you're focusing completely. On the way that people are using their words, try not to use the subtitles. So,、um, kind of play around with it a little bit. If there's a word that's difficult for you to hear, you can actually turn on the subtitles in, like the in the native、uh, language of the movie as well. That's something that I've done. Like if. Uh, like if I wanted to study Japanese, it's very useful when the actual words spoken in Japanese appear on the screen. Sometimes it's easier for me to catch a word if I see it visually and I hear it at the same time. So another way to kind of、um, explore how you can use TV and movies is to actually turn on the closed captions, like the the、um, the words on the screen. In the native language of the movie, so、uh, so this is sort of two points in one. So one, watch movies without subtitles, meaning subtitles in your native language. And hint two is to watch movies、um, with closed captioning on, but the closed captioning is in your target language, not in your native language. So you can try those two things with TV and with、um, movies. Don't bring a dictionary to your lesson. Tip number five is don't bring a dictionary to your lesson. Okay, so、uh, give me a second here. So I understand that dictionaries, especially electronic dictionaries, we have them on our phones now, are very very convenient.、Um, of course, it's important to use them, and it's、um, they're a great resource to have. However, one thing that、uh, really bothers me and that I think is detrimental, it's not helpful for students, is when Uh, students are in a lesson and they're practicing conversation, and they reach a point in the conversation where they don't know the word they want to use. They know it in their native language, and they don't know how to say it in their target language. They pull out their dictionary. They say to the the person listening to them, their practice partner in their lesson, where they have a limited period of time, just a moment, and then they look it up on their phone. And it takes. A few seconds, the, the flow of the conversation stops, and then they say a word. <laughs> it's like, whoa, no, that's not. You don't have that ability. You don't have the ability to do that in a conversation with a native speaker. Most people, like if you go to a bank and try to open a bank account, are you really going to pull out your dictionary and sit there and try to? Communicate, you know, just a moment, just a moment. As you look up each word, you don't know, no. Or if you do, that's not a real conversation. So instead, try using a different strategy. By that I mean, if you find a word you don't know in conversation, explain the word to your conversation partner. Maybe they know the word. If you're speaking with a native speaker, this is a chance for them to teach you a word. I find that when people take the time to teach me a word. 
I remember the word much better than just looking it up on my dictionary. So try to resist. Maybe you can bring a dictionary to your lesson, but don't use it or try not to use it in your conversation practice. It's just it destroys the flow of a conversation. So instead, practice the skill of describing the vocabulary word you want to use and. Learn how to ask the meaning of a word, or learn how to ask for a vocabulary word from your partner. So you can use an expression like "Ah, what's the word that means blah blah blah," or、um, you know, it's this thing that does this and this and this. So this is an opportunity for you to describe characteristics of something or find a different way. You can use your body language. You can use whatever. You have a lot of tools, but. Try not to use a dictionary in a conversation because it's not realistic. Train responses to common questions. Number six is a quick one, I think. Number six, hint number six, I have is just to train responses to common questions. Train responses to common questions. So, for example,、uh, a very common question in English is, "Hey, how are you?" You should know how to answer this question. Just have a default response. Hey, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> like. If it takes you a long time to answer the question, "Hey, how are you?" You need to practice. I think that's a pretty good、uh, a pretty good indicator. So, for example, sometimes I ask students a question like that they they haven't quite gotten the idea of how to respond just yet. They they they're not so quick at responding. I say,、uh, "Hey, how are you?" And they say, "Yes." And then they think, and they go, "I'm, uh, I'm uh, good." <laughs> and it's like that's a very common question. So think about just a default response that you can spit out, that you can quickly say. If it's "How was your weekend?" or "Hey, what's up?" or "What do you want to do for dinner tonight?" Think about like just a handful, meaning just a few responses to those questions, and train them quickly. Just "How are you?" "I'm good." "How are you?" "I'm okay." "How are you?" "Not bad." There's three, so it's just training responses to those questions. There's no reason to be surprised by a question like "How are you?" Like that's a very common question. So for those common questions, train responses to that. We've got a bunch of videos, especially beginner level videos, for some example responses you can do. So don't get stuck with these little questions. Just train a few responses, practice a few responses till they feel natural to you. It'll save you time, and it'll help the person asking the question too to move forward in the conversation. Yay! Study with materials that don't provide a translation. The next tip is to study with materials that don't provide a translation. So by this I mean if you're using worksheets and, or some kind of textbook、uh, or whatever. And it has your target language, the language you're studying, and it has your native language next to it. While this can be useful, I feel that if you can studying your materials only in your target language and then simplified explanations for more detailed points, also in your target language, can be a little bit better. So. I sh- I don't want to say like you should only study things in your target language and nothing from your native language because of course like it's it can be helpful sometimes to look up a word or to understand a grammar point in your native language. But where possible, if you can find something that provides simplified explanations in your target language, it can be really really helpful because again you're thinking you're learning to think on like a simpler on a more basic level about the language you're studying. In the language that you're studying, so this can be really, really good. So finding some materials to use where there's no translation. Maybe you can practice,、um, of course, with with books and with written materials, but also with like video materials as well. So there are a variety of different ways that you can.、Um, Find materials in your target language,、um, like in video and TV. So, some things to think about there are the vo- level of vocabulary words people are using in the media content you're watching,、um, who the media content is intended for, children, young adults, adults,、uh, the speed at which the speaker is talking. So, like I have the ability to change the level of difficulty. Of、uh, videos based on the rate of speech, the vocabulary words that I use, and how many like idioms and things I use. So I could make a video very difficult. We could make a very like a very difficult video series by leveling up our vocabulary use or by speaking very quickly. 
Or, as you might see in like our English in three minutes series,、um, we can also use very simple vocabulary and speak at a low rate of speech. So maybe right now this is a very intermediate level video. So please think about that. So not just for、um, written materials, but also for your audio and visual materials. Think about、um, who your audience is, the level of the material, and so on. It can be really fun. Uh, and it can be helpful to think about、um, your your target language in your target language. All right, we're almost done. Study phrases in addition to single vocabulary. The next tip is study phrases in addition to single vocabulary words. So yes, of course, vocabulary is important, but I find it personally very very useful to look at how a vocabulary word is used in a phrase. Because sometimes using it in a phrase helps you understand the nuance of that vocabulary word really, really well. So if I like a word like crazy, for example, in English, depending on the situation where the word crazy is used, it could mean something different. It could mean like a person who is mentally confused or mixed up. It could also mean something really good. It could mean something really bad. So, if we look only at the word "crazy," it's quite difficult to understand really the meaning of the word. But if you look at the way the word is used in a phrase, you can get a lot more information. So, take a look at the way people use words in phrases, not just as single vocabulary words. You can learn a lot more that way. I think. Do your daily activities in English where possible. The next tip is to do your daily activities in your target language.、Uh, so, if you're studying English, that means try to do some daily activities in English if possible. So, this can be very, very boring stuff, but just think about it when you're doing the activity. So, like right now, I'm filming a video for EnglishClass101.com, or I'm going to work, I'm cooking breakfast, I'm doing the laundry. What do I have to do tomorrow? So. Try thinking about your everyday life in English if you're studying English. Try thinking about your everyday activities, the people that you meet. What are you doing? So this is a way to help you practice your verbs. So if you don't know, if you're I don't know, you're doing something at work and you're like, oh my gosh, how do I explain the what's the verb for you know a picture? Like I want to blah 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 a picture. What's the word? You can check a dictionary at that point and go, ah,、oh, it's draw. I I need to use the verb draw for draw a picture. So you can find these little gaps in your everyday life, these little gaps in your knowledge, if you think about、um, your everyday activities in your target language. If you don't think about it in your target language, you might not realize you have vocabulary gaps or phrase gaps here and there. So this is a really good and kind of funny, actually, way to study. Use a learner's dictionary for new words. The last tip is to use a learner's dictionary for new words. So in English, there are learner's dictionaries available in English. So、uh, my favorite, my personal favorite, is Merriam-Webster. Merriam-Webster is a fantastic dictionary resource. They're so interesting, and they have tons of like historical information. I really do just sit and like read things on the dictionary page lately. It's true, but.、Um, Of course, there's a definition. There's a meaning for words. There are example sentences for words. But Merriam-Webster also has what's called a learner's dictionary. If you find a word that you don't recognize, you can check it at,、uh, in a dictionary, in a learner's dictionary, and it gives you a simplified, a simple explanation in simple English. Of that word, so instead of checking it in your native language, you can check it in your target language. So again, this helps you to understand the word、um, that you are that you're focused on, but you understand it from、um, the language you're studying, not from your native language. So using a learner's dictionary can be really, really useful as well. All right. So those are ten tips. Those are ten tips to help you stop translating in your head. I know it's very difficult, but it's it takes time and it takes practice. And I hope that these are a few strategies that can help you as you study、uh, any language. Of course, this is an English language channel, an English language learning channel. But I think these tips are pretty good for learning just about any language, really. So I hope those are useful for you. If you have tried these strategies, or if you have any other comments or other tips, please let us. 
know in the comment section below this video. If you liked this video, please make sure to hit the thumbs up, share this video, and subscribe to our channel too. Check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more good stuff as well. Thanks very much for watching this episode of Top Words, and I will see you again soon. Bye! Hi everyone, I'm Bridget, and welcome to today's lesson. Today's topic is 10 ways to say hello in English. Good morning. Good morning is the first thing you say to someone when you see them in the morning. Good morning, sir. Would you like a cup of coffee? Good morning. Could I please get some orange juice? Good morning. I'm still tired from the night before. Hello. Hello is the most common greeting you'll hear. That and hi. Hello is a polite, nice way to greet someone when you see them. Hello. Everyone says it. You cannot go wrong saying hello. Hello can be used at any time of the day, no matter whether it's morning or at night or at 4 a.m. When you see someone, you can say hello and it will still be appropriate. Long time no see. Long time no see. It's not necessarily grammatically correct, but it's a saying that we have. Hey, long time no see. What it means is that you haven't seen that person in a long time. So it literally means long time no see. Long time no see is something you say to someone when you haven't seen them in a while. Hey, John. Long time no see. How are the wife and kids? How have you been? Hey, how have you been? I haven't seen you in a long time. How have you been is asking someone how they're doing and how they've been for the past however long if you haven't seen them in a while. You might say, hey, long time no see. How have you been? How have you been? That's past tense. It implies that you haven't seen them in a while and you want to hear about how they are and how they've been for all of that time that you haven't seen them. Hey, long time no see. How have you been? How are you? How are you? Means how are you doing? How are you feeling? How is everything? It's a standard thing that you might say to anyone, even if you've seen them the day before. You might see them today and say, hey, how are you? How's it going? Hey, how's it going? How's it going is a more informal way to say, how are you? So, how are you and how's it going, they mean the same thing. It's asking how you are doing, how you are feeling. Is everything okay with you? What's up? What's up is another way of saying, hey, how's it going? But this one is even more informal. So, you might say this to friends, hey, what's up? And they'll say, nothing, just living my life, you know, day in and day out. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Would you like some lunch? Good afternoon is a polite way to greet someone in the afternoon. So if you run into your boss, you might say, good afternoon. It's very nice. It's polite. Not a lot of people say it to their friends, but it's, it's a polite way to greet someone. Good evening. Good evening is a nice way to greet someone in the evening time. You can only use this phrase in the evening because it's wishing someone a good evening. It's saying hello at a certain time of day. Good evening. Would you like some dinner? Good evening. Have you eaten yet? All of my examples involve food, it seems. It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. This is something that's very common to say the first time that you meet someone. You might shake their hand and say, Hi, it's nice to meet you. My name is Bridget. My name is... It's telling that person that you are happy to be meeting them. It's a pleasure to meet them. Hi, it's nice to meet you. That brings us to the end of this lesson, 10 ways to say hello. If you guys liked the video, please don't forget to give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. And don't forget to go to EnglishClass101.com for more English.
Okay, everybody. Shift information has been posted for the month. It looks like we'll visit 25 cities in 30 days. Do we normally visit 25 different cities in one month? Yes. Sometimes we visit even more. Where's our first stop? Charlotte. Hey, I have friends in Charlotte. It would be nice to see them. Good evening, in-room dining. This is Alex. How may I be of service? Hello, I would like to order some food. Of course, ma'am. Just to confirm, this is Mrs. Rawson in room 417? Yes, it is. Excellent. May I take your order? Yes, I would like a turkey sandwich on a Parmesan bagel. And what to drink? A Diet Coke. Will there be anything else? Yes, I would also like a wake-up call for seven. My major is education. How about you? I'm an English major. Cool. I like English. Oh, and what's Oksana's major? She's also an English major. That's nice. You can help each other study. Yep. In fact, I need to meet her now so we can study together. Okay. It was nice talking with you. You too. See you later. See ya. Good evening, ma'am. May I have your first and last names? Melissa West. Thank you, ma'am. I have found your reservation. Here's the registration information. Does everything look correct to you? Yes, it seems to be correct. Excellent. Now, I will just need a photo ID for legal purposes. Will my passport do? That would be just fine, ma'am. Checkout is between noon and two o'clock. You may request an extension of up to five hours free of charge. What if I need more time? Then a late charge of 5% will be added to your bill. Hey, Vicky, did you forget our study date at 10 this morning? I'm sorry, Naomi. At 10, I was talking with my professor and couldn't get away. I'm sorry. I should have called. That's okay. So, how did the meeting go with the professor? It went fine. He gave me an extension on my paper, and I can still take the midterm. How was your study group yesterday? Well, we were studying together during lunch when I noticed an old friend of mine from high school in the same cafe. My concentration quickly switched from class to catching up with my friend, so I didn't get much done. You've taken that class before, right? Yeah, last semester. I was always asking questions in that class because it was so difficult. Well, I was hoping that you could lend me a hand with my paper. I can't think of anything else to write. Sure, no problem. That is, if you can help me study for our history test. Sounds like a deal. Want to speak real English from your first lesson? Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. Hi everyone, I'm Christine from EnglishClass101.com. In this video, we'll be talking about how to curse like an English native speaker. Piss, a slang term for urine. For example, don't piss your pants. You can say this when you're really scared or anxious. For example, if you're about to go on stage to make a speech or perform, someone can say, don't piss your pants. You can do it. Pissed off, to be really angry. When I'm angry, I can say, hey, I'm really pissed off at you right now. Why did you do that for? Loser, used to describe an uncool person. In high school, my friends and I would use this a lot and we would say, hey loser, how's it going? Idiot, used to insult people by saying they're not intelligent. Of all the mean things that you can say, this is on the lighter side, but people still use it. Shoot, this is used to show disappointment or frustration without using a stronger curse word. Shoot, I spilled my coffee. Shut up. You can use this when you want them to be quiet or there's something surprising that you just heard. You can say, shut up, no way. Ticked off to be really angry. You can say this with pissed off. So this is actually an older term. Not many people use this. 
as much anymore because most people actually just use pissed off. Fool. This is similar to saying someone is like a clown. You can say, you're acting like a fool right now. <gasps> Jerk. This is a light insult used to describe someone who is mean. For example, if there's someone bullying another person, that person is being a jerk. Wimp. This means someone who isn't strong. There is a movie out right now called Diary of a Wimpy Kid. Have you seen it? Have you not? I haven't yet. So how was it? If you have any more questions, please leave a comment below. See you next time. Hey everyone, I'm Paris from EnglishClass101.com. In this video, we're talking about how to ask and give directions. Let's start. To the left, to the left. The first phrase is, where is the? Where is the? For example, you can ask, where is the bank? This can be used to ask for a general location or detailed directions. Don't be surprised if you only receive basic information. For example, next to the grocery store. The next phrase is, I need to go to the. I need to go to the. For example, you can say, I need to go to the police station. The word need is used, but this is used for non-emergencies as well. How do I get to the? How do I get to the? For example, you can say, how do I get to the museum? This question can be used to ask for step-by-step -step directions instead of a general location. Is the near here? Is the near here, for example? You can say, is the library near here? If you're unfamiliar with an area, you can ask to get this information about a specific place where you want to go. Is the bathroom near here? Excuse me, do you know where the is? Excuse me, do you know where the is? For example, you can say, excuse me, do you know where the park is? Only use excuse me when you're starting a conversation with a stranger. Another common phrase is, is the far from here? Is the far from here? For example, you can say, is the post office far from here? This is an indirect way to ask for directions. People will tell you how far the place is and probably tell you the best way to get there. Walking, taking a bus, driving, Uber. Now let's take a look at expressions to give directions. Turn left. Turn left. For example, you can say, turn left after two blocks. This gives you information about how far you should go before you make any changes. In this case, you should go left. To the left, to the left. Turn right. Turn right. For example, you can say, turn right at the third traffic light. This also gives you information about how far you should go before taking another action. In this case, you should go right. Go straight. Go straight. This simply tells you to go in one direction. It also implies that if you keep going straight, that you will eventually find what you're looking for. Go past. Go past. For example, you can say, go past the church. A landmark is just an easily noticeable place. For example, a movie, theater, restaurant, at the corner of, at the corner of. For example, you can say, it's at the corner of. This means that a place is located at the corner where two streets meet. In front of, in front of. For example, you can say, the bus station is in front of the supermarket. We use front to refer to the main entrance of a building. It can also mean visible from the front and doesn't necessarily mean it's directly in front of something. Behind, behind. For example, you can say the parking lot is behind the movie theater. We use behind to say that something is at the rear of a building. The front of a building is its main entrance, so which side it's facing the street is really not important. Next to, next to. For example, you can say the restaurant is next to the park. This is an example of using a non-specific location to give general directions. Next to can be anywhere beside, in front of, or around a place. McDonald's is next to my house. Between. Between. For example, you can say, the store is between the coffee shop and the pet store. Between is used with two other places. 
When using between, the main place will always be in the middle of the two other places. Okay, that's all for this lesson. Which phrase do you like the most? Leave us a comment and let us know. And I'll see you next time, guys. Bye. Hey guys, I'm Paris from EnglishClass101.com. In this video, we'll be talking about making complaints in English. So let's get started. The first complaint is, I'm starving. I'm starving. This is an exaggeration you can use when you're hungry. I am always starving, even right now. The next complaint is, it's noisy. It's noisy. This kind of complaint is one that you would make to a friend. Telling the staff of a restaurant won't help since they can't tell people to be quiet. I hate when it's noisy in restaurants. Save that for another time. Then we have, it's hot. It's hot. This can be used to talk about the weather or the temperature of a room. You can add a request like, can you turn on the air conditioner? I am never hot, so I like that. The next complaint is, it's cold. It's cold. This can be used to talk about the weather or the temperature of a room. You can add a request like, can you turn on the heater? I always make this request because it's always too cold everywhere, everywhere. It's too expensive. It's too expensive. Even if you have enough money to buy something, it may be more money than you want to spend. It would probably be considered rude to say this to someone who works at a store, but I always think, okay, I'm in Gucci, it's way too expensive. <sighs> Another common complaint is, I'm tired. I'm tired. Use this complaint to imply that you want to sit down, relax, go home, take a break. When I babysit my five-year-old cousin, I leave thinking, I'm tired. <sighs> the next complaint is, I gained weight. I gained weight. This is a self-criticism that implies that you want to lose weight. Many people say, I got so fat. <sighs> I'm always broke. I'm always broke. Use this to complain about never having enough money. I am always broke because I always want more money. <sighs> the next complaint is, my job is boring. My job is boring. This is a really common complaint used by people who don't think their jobs are very exciting. Usually it means that you want to find a different, more fun job. It's all right, teachers, your job isn't boring. That person stinks. That person stinks. You can use stinks to talk about a literal physical smell or a general insult meaning that you don't like how someone smells. I hate when people smell on the bus. Not good, not okay. The next complaint is there's too much traffic. There's too much traffic. This is a common complaint among people who commute to work by car. Certain roads are especially bad during rush hour, which is the time in the morning or night most people are going home or to work. If I left at, it was 7 p.m., I would be here in 10 minutes. But because it's daytime in LA, it took me 30 minutes to get here, and I drive really, really fast. <laughs> and it still took me 30 minutes. The next complaint is, the Wi-Fi here is too slow. The Wi-Fi here is too slow. This is just a general complaint you may have about the internet speed. If you're at a cafe or somewhere with Wi-Fi, you can request that they reset the Wi-Fi to improve the speed. If you're having a party and you're having friends over and your Wi-Fi is too slow, you might as well end that party now. No Wi-Fi, no party. My boss is annoying. My boss is annoying. Annoying can be used to mean that someone does things that you don't like or they ask you to do things that you don't like. Either way, an annoying boss is a bad experience. I am very familiar with this. Hey Paris, grab me coffee. Hey Paris, check my emails. My boss is annoying. But don't tell him I said that. The pay is too low. The pay is too low. You can use this to complain about how much you make or to reject a job offer because it doesn't pay enough. I'm a surgeon. The pay is too low. I don't like it. I don't like it. This is a very general complaint that can be used for almost anything. What don't I like? <laughs> Posting a thousand selfies on Instagram. I don't like it. Mm -mm. Okay, that's it for this lesson. Which complaint do you like more? Leave us a comment and let me know. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.
You just got a text message from your hotel's pickup service. What does the first number refer to? What does the first number refer to? The number in the text message refers to the customer code. You are at a train station where you've just bought an express ticket. Which train car row and seat number are you in? Which train car row and seat number are you in? The ticket says that you're in train car number one in the eighth row in seat C. You are at a train station where you're attempting to buy an express ticket from a ticket machine. Which option should you choose to buy an express ticket? Which option should you choose to buy an express ticket? The option on the bottom left is for an express ticket. You are on a platform at a train station where you're waiting for your train. Suddenly, a message appears on the display. What does the message on the display mean? What does the message on the display mean? The display reads, the next train will not stop. You are at a train station where you're reading the train schedule for an express ticket that you've just bought. On which days are there no express trains running? On which days are there no express trains running? There are no express trains running on public holidays and the third Sunday of every month. Want to speak real English from your first lesson?
Sign up for your free lifetime account at EnglishClass101.com. You are on a platform at a train station where you're waiting for your train. Suddenly, a message appears on the display. What does the message on the display mean? What does the message on the display mean? The display reads, the next train will not stop. You are at a train station where you're looking for the best exit to catch a taxi. Which exit should you take to get to the taxi stop? Which exit should you take to get to the taxi stop? You should take the east exit in order to get to the taxi stop. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia and today I am joined again in the studio by... Michael, hello. And today we're going to be talking about things that were cool in the 90s. So things that were interesting or things that maybe we were interested in in the 90s. I'm guessing that we're going to have some very different opinions uh, based on our experiences of the 90s. So let's get right into it. Michael, your first item please. Um, okay, boy bands. So I remember boy bands were very, very popular uh, when I was a kid in the 90s. I had three older brothers who would punch me and tell me, boy bands are for girls, don't like boy bands. Um, so that was my experience with them. And they became kind of uncool, I feel like, after the 90s. And then they never were uncool in like Korea and like a lot of Asian countries. They still had like a strong boy band mm -hmm. kind of uh, scene or whatever. Man But bands now. Is that really what they're called? No, I don't know. I just mean, I think, I feel like boy, there are boy bands. That are now becoming boys to men. Maybe that's the... <laughs> so, I mean, now they, it came, <laughs> now it came back. Like, uh, what is the, uh, what's the British one? Now it's kind of cool again. Oh, One Direction. One Direction, yeah. So I think it's come back. It's full circle. Um, Didn't they just break up? I'm going to go with something that I loved in the 90s. This is probably way too specific. Uh... Probably. But it's this show called Doug that was on Nickelodeon. And there weren't a whole lot of episodes of Doug. It was, I don't know, like 20 or 30, I feel like. Not even that many. Did you many. ever see this show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's very nostalgic for me. I don't... 20, 30 episodes? I, I, feel, I feel like I had, I'd seen them all. So I, 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 I know that I saw them all because I, they, it would come back. It would come on one day after school and I'd be like, oh, I've seen this episode. But the whole, the whole idea with Doug is Doug was like this, just this plain kid and he had an older sister, he went to school, he had a dog, he had a best friend, and he would just encounter these everyday life scenarios that would be kind of troubling or he wouldn't know how to deal with them. But like he was kind of a role model, I feel like. He was kind of being like a good kid. Mm -hmm. um, or sometimes he would get into trouble, but then, you know, eventually he would solve the problem or he'd find a way out of it. So, mm -hmm. but I really loved that show. I really loved Nickelodeon in general um, during the 90s. Mm -hmm. and Yeah. Did you watch that channel? Yeah, of course. I loved Nickelodeon. Um, I think it was more like Fox, stuff like that. But I guess I'll segue into another one of mine. Mm -hmm. You're talking about wholesome. So something that's my childhood, I was raised on TV was sitcoms. Yeah. So I think this has kind of died down again, like the boy bands where it, it, people think it's cheesy. Now it's all reality TV shows, that kind of stuff. But that's, that is my childhood right there is, you know, Full House and these kinds of shows step by step mm -hmm. where there's a moral at the end of the story. And right. so everyone, there's always kind of like the, the protagonist is always like, maybe he's unsure, but by the end, they know the right thing to do and they play like the violin kind of sad, not quite sad, but like, 
heartwarming music, and yeah. then they're like, well, and then they give a speech. And as a kid, you know, That's you don't right. really like think about it, but that gets into your like I I whew, man deep because of Full House. If you lie, I've learned this. It's deep in my subconscious. If you lie, and then you keep lying, it snowballs. And it gets worse and worse and worse. So it's best to just right away tell the truth. That was a really common theme in most sitcoms, I think. That, like, they're just trying to teach kids don't lie, it's bad. Yeah, you're right, you're right. Mm-hmm. Sitcoms are huge. And by the way, sitcoms um, is, um, is a portmanteau, portmanteau meaning two words put together, of situation and comedy. So situation and comedy equals sitcom in this case. Okay, nice, nice. Um, I'm going to go to my next one. Um, let's see. I think probably every little girl in the 90s, in America anyway, knew what this was. I don't know if you knew. Um, it's this brand called Lisa Frank. Um, Lisa Frank. Are you aware of Lisa Frank? Are you aware of Lisa Frank? No? Okay. She knows. (laughs) She knows who Lisa Frank is. (laughs) So Lisa Frank is, um, just bright. It was always like brightly colored school supplies. Uh, like pinks and purples and blues, and it would always have unicorns and dolphins and mystical creatures. It was just bright, and everybody, all the girls loved it. I loved it. I had Lisa Frank, just whatever I could get my hands on. It'd be pencils or erasers or just pinks and rainbows and hearts and stuff like that. So I think every every girl who grew up in the 90s knows what Lisa Frank is. Ah, okay. So talking about style and whatnot... Grunge. Grunge is something that I, that hits close to home for me and I think that came out of the 90s is, um, I mean, everybody knows around the world, I think most people know Nirvana, uh, Kurt Cobain. And this is something that I guess was brought to the world from Seattle and it was a music genre and it was kind of, it's like rock, but sometimes slower, almost emo, kind of like sad, usually undertones. But anyways, the style that came with it was the opposite of like the 80s and, and early 90s of really bright colors. You know, it was the opposite. You just wear holy jeans. You don't really shower that much. You don't shave and like plaid and just really like dreary colors. Mm-hmm. So that was really popular. I, at least I remember in like the yeah, early 90s, it was like huge. mid 90s. Yeah. yeah ner- I, and it's as soon as I saw that card grunge, I was like, Oh, Nirvana. That was, that's the first thing that comes to mind when I hear about, when I hear grunge. Mm. I didn't get into the grunge scene though. I was, I was busy with boy bands, but like <laughs> grunge for me was never really, I was aware, I was aware of Nirvana, but I did not, I was not of the Nirvana mm. pod. Okay. I'm going to go to a style point then too, because you've brought up a style point. I'll put up, bring up maybe, um, a female style point. Scrunchies, uh, still popular perhaps among some people. What is a scrunchie? A scrunchie. Let's see. I don't have, um, so there's regular rubber bands that you can use to tie back long hair. He's making an O shape with his hands. Yes. (laughs) This is very descriptive. Very descriptive, Michael. Thank you. No, you, I'm the prop. And then you go like this. Digga, 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 digga. There's like the. I bet, I bet, I bet there's an awesome video team somewhere in the, somewhere that can put Mm. like a scrunchie like right here. (laughs) Anyway. Um, yeah, a scrunchie is just, it's just a, a, a piece of elastic with some kind of colorful cloth wrapped around it. And it, but when not in use, it would go and it would scrunch. I think. I think this is why we call it a scrunchie. <laughs> but then when you pull on it, you could expand it a bit and wrap your hair up in it. And then when you were finished doing that, it would kind of close around it. Um, I had a couple. Nintendo. Um, anything, any game-related stuff. I remember Game Boys, anything handheld. Um, except when I was a kid, it, it wasn't like this fancy 3D, high, you know, highly, like, vibrant colors. Mm-hmm. It was like black and white and like you'd play it in the car and you had to squint and it hurts your head you know if you're playing too much you're getting like car sick and you're like you can barely see mario are you talking about game boy game boy Uh, or any like there was handheld too there was like atari and stuff like that and like sega sega was pretty good that would light up i was thinking about nes when you said nintendo i imagined Mm. my nes the one that like when it wasn't working correctly you could just pull the cassette out and (laughs) put it back in so you put the cartridge in here right and sometimes if it was really stubborn and it didn't work you would blow into this part and you try, and it really doesn't make a difference. But you would take turns. Like, me and my brothers would be like, no, you want to be the one to get it to work. So you take turns. You're like, no, 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 let me, let me, let me. And just by luck, it would work. And you're like, see, see, yeah. No, this is super nostalgic. I love Nintendo. I have a game, too. Pogs. Do you have Pogs? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Pogs are 
either are simultaneously the most brilliant game and the stupidest game ever invented. They're just discs of cardboard about this size. Uh, <clears throat> and on one side, there's a picture. And on the other side, there's just nothing. And then you had a, a thing called a slammer, which was essentially just a heavy pog uh, <laughs> that you would use. And you had to flip, you had to use the slammer to flip the... I get Plain that. cardboard ones? What? I don't even know. It, it was that stupid and forgettable of a game, but it was like crazy. When I was about, I don't know, like second or third grade or something, everybody had pogs. Like mm. we had pog gym days at my school. I remember this kids, vividly. America, like, we're really obese. Let's go into the gym and sit there and smash cardboard. <laughs> that, that'll we solve the problem. We played pogs. And like, I was telling, I was telling her before we started this, like, one day, like, my mom wanted me to get a haircut and I was just being stubborn and I wasn't having it. I was in the mall. I was like, I don't want to get a haircut. She's like, I'll buy you pogs. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. <laughs> it was like this giant tube of pogs, and I was just so thrilled, and I agreed to get my hair cut. Well, that was a lot of things that, was, that were exciting and or popular and or we were into in the 90s. What were you into in the 90s? What was popular in your country? I really have no idea what was popular around the world uh, at that time. Maybe some of these things are similar. Please let us know in the comments. I'm very interested to find out. We read these, by the way. Um, any thoughts? Any other any closing thoughts about the 90s? You're not going to sing a song for us? No mm, boy band bop, songs? Mm, bop, mm, bop. Oh, well, that's copyright. We can't do that. Just like blur that all out. No, that was that was very accurate. So I'm sure we can use that. <laughs> and perfect. by very Tone accurate, perfect. I mean totally wrong. <laughs> Clearly, we're very good at talking about the '90s. Okay, but uh, we hope that you are too. We hope that you learned something exciting about the '90s. Um, that's all for us today. Thanks very much for watching, and we will see you again soon. Bye. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia, and I'm joined again in the studio by Michael. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about English conversation strategies. So let's get right into it. Let's start with Michael. What is your first strategy for keeping an English conversation going? This is very important. Don't say, I'm fine, thank you, and you. You hear this all the time from second language English learners or non-native speakers. You learn this, it's one of the first things you learn in an English class. It's mm. easy, it's good, it's basic, it's foundation. Okay, that's fine. But as soon as you can, switch it up. Because to me, when I meet a foreigner and they come up, and if they say, hey, how are you? I say, oh, I'm fine, you know, I'm good, whatever. How about you? And they say, I'm fine, thank you, and you. And it's just, it's almost robotic because I've said it so many times. And when I hear that, I think, ah, their English isn't that good. Mm. And inside, I'm just going to be really polite and say hello and talk slowly and try to get out of there as quick as I can. So really impress the foreigner. In my opinion, I think the best way to do it is say something, you know, Use a big word or just like a slang word, something like that. When I hear that, I go, wow, man, I want to know what this person thinks. I want to get their point of view, and I'm really excited. And then I've had great conversations because of that. Um, yeah, mm. that's a really, really good one. And actually, I think on this YouTube channel, actually, from a couple years ago, there's a video all about better answers to the question, how are you, than I'm fine, thank you, and you. Or if someone says, hey, how are you? I'm good. You? Or... Fine, you. Never, I'm fine, thank you, and you. Never. But try to actually use, you know, a phrase that a native speaker would use, and then that's a clue to the native speaker that, oh, maybe this person is ready for a conversation beyond, you know, basic English. So that's a really good point. I like that. I didn't think of things not to do. I only thought of things to do. So, okay. Cool. Um, let's see. Let's go to my first one. Um, oh, oh, oh. So um, this strategy in general is just ask the other person a question. Uh, I think, and I'm guilty of this too when I'm learning another language, I tend to only get input. Like somebody else is always asking me the questions and then I forget myself to ask the other person a question. So one question that I like to ask or, you know, a variation, any kind of WH question is good, like a who question, what, where. Um, something like this, if you've been paying attention, you can use anyway to transition in your conversation. This was in a previous video. You can ask something like anyway up to anything fun this weekend. This is a pretty casual conversational question that you can ask just about anybody, um, whether you've just met them or whether you've known them for a while. But just, just get in the habit of asking other people the question. Don't wait for someone else to ask you the question. Um, so that, that's one strategy that I try to use to keep things going. 
Yeah, me too. I agree. And I'm going to say same Z's because actually two of my questions were exactly what you said. Agree 100%. This is kind of cheating. These should be one. but So always ask questions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, you forget. It's really easy. I'm really guilty of this. Mm. English, non-English, whatever. I'm, I'm guilty of this. Um, and the other thing is ask deep, open-ended questions. So if you ask a yes or no question, so again, like Alicia was saying, it, it just dead ends. Mm. You can't just say, you know, do you like cheese? Yes or no, right? So you want to say, what do you think about cheese? What is your favorite kind? And kind of open it up to something else and let it, let it just kind of snowball. Right, um, right. Yeah, yeah. I, think, I think that that's, that's really a key. Like I have another variation on it, which I guess I'll just continue on to because it kind of relates to what you're talking about. Like he's saying, always ask questions. Always ask deep, open-ended questions. So like you, may, you just said, don't ask a yes or no question because yes or no ends with the yes or the no. So one of the things that I'll do is um, use a pattern similar to this, like, hey, did you see or hey, did you hear about blah, blah, blah. So you can use this little blah, blah, blah as your, uh, you can ask about the news. Uh, you can ask about something funny you saw on the internet. You can ask about, um, you know, some, something that you heard from another friend of yours, whatever. Uh, it's just a way to check in with the other person and say, oh, did you also experience this thing that I experienced? Let's talk about that. So that might be another question that you can use with people. I like that one. I really like that one because you got to stay within people's comfort zone. So maybe you ask and maybe they don't want to, right? So a good thing is, did you hear about it? That's up to them. Maybe they don't want to talk about it. They can say, oh yeah, I heard about that. And you can kind of feel uh, the, the atmosphere and, and realize, eh, maybe I shouldn't talk about this, change the subject. Or they get passionate and they start talking about it. And there you go. And just let it go. Um, yeah, absolutely. Mm. One thing, again, I'm guilty of is, is you do got to keep, keep returning it. Right. Don't let it, don't just say, oh yeah, and what I think about da 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 bring it back, ask them, what about you? Mm. Uh, that's, that's a common thing I forget about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, good. I have one more. This one, um, use when you see fit. Don't, I guess, just, okay, I'll just introduce it. Compliment the other person or compliment the other person. This can be a nice strategy just to show that you're enjoying the other person's company um, it can be as simple as, oh, I like your shirt today, or oh, that's a nice dress you're wearing today, or oh, did you get a new haircut that looks good on you? Something like that. So this is a nice, a nice way to make the other person maybe want to spend more time with you, I think. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, two things. One, I think it's a good conversation starter sometimes. Um, if you got to be careful. With a stranger, it can be creepy. It can be a little uncomfortable what you're complimenting, right? But if mm -hmm. it's something like if they have a t-shirt and it's a band that you both like, that's a great conversation starter, and you feel, wow, we're connected, you know. Mm -hmm. um, number two, the, the second thing I was thinking about is that keep it honest. I love, I love mm -hmm. a sincere compliment. It really means a lot more, and, and it really does butter them up, kind of get them open to, to having more conversations deeper, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things people do, which, which I don't like, is let's say they say, hey, nice shirt. And then the person, out of habit, will say, oh, you too, I like your shirt too. Just my opinion, I don't think this feels really natural, doesn't really feel sincere. So I would, I would save it, make a mental note and go, hmm, I need to return the favor. I need to give them a compliment. But wait until you notice something you really do like and say, hey, actually, I love blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's a great point. Like hmm. when you, you can sense whether someone is being sincere or not. What is your next strategy <laughs> for continuing an English conversation? Well, don't be afraid to open up. I like this one. I think this is good. Um, a lot of people will be kind of shy. They won't open up too much. Again, within, within your comfort zone. But I like this one um, because people will return the favor. Because if you're just having small talk and you say, you know, the weather's nice today, blah, 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 you can only go so far. So don't be afraid to say something personal. Again, trust your judgment. Don't be a creeper. Don't go, we don't want to hear certain things about your life. So don't, don't be a creep. Don't be a creep. Don't be weird. Don't be strange. And like what you're saying about opening up. Open up is just a phrase that means share something about yourself. Um, so it can be as simple as what you did last weekend or what you're going to do this weekend or a project that you have coming up. It doesn't mean that you have to spill all of your life secrets to the other person, but just showing that you're willing to share something more personal about yourself can help ingratiate yourself or can help, you know, make the other person Help the other person understand you a little bit better. That's a good tip. I like that tip. That's hard to do, though. It's hard. It's a mm. little bit scary, I think, yeah. to share parts of yourself. But it's good. It's a good way to meet people and make friends. All right. I think that's all. Is that all that you have? Yeah, that's okay. all I got. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, those are some interesting uh, strategies 
to keep an English conversation going. So give them a try. If you're ever at a loss for words and don't know what to say, you can try one of these strategies and hopefully it will help you out. Um, please let us know if you have any other strategies or anything else that you would like to use or you try to use when you are having trouble keeping a conversation going. Uh, leave us a comment and let us know what it is. We will see you again next time. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? That's about it. All right, so thanks very much for joining us and take care, bye bye. Remember, here's what you can do to learn all of these words by heart. Drill these words with our spaced repetition flashcards, which will help cement these words into your long-term memory. Save them to the word bank, your personal vocabulary collection, where you can print out your own study sheets, or review the words with our looped vocabulary slideshow and play it until you know all of the words. So click the link in the description right now and sign up for your free lifetime account to get these lessons and study tools.